Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, we continue talking about waves. Um, we have uh, learned about longitudinal waves, which basically are like waves of the sound in the air when the molecules of air are moving in the same direction where the waves are propagated. So the waves are actually the differences in pressure of air in this particular case. So the molecules are going this way back and forth and the sound is propagating the same way. So the movements of carriers of the um, oscillations are exactly in the same direction as oscillations themselves. Today we will learn about a different kind of waves maybe the waves which you're kind of more accustomed to. Um, these are waves when the molecules of the carrier of the waves are moving not in the direction but perpendicular to direction. So it's like a rope when you are shaking uh, up and down one of the ends of the rope the waves are going along the rope and the movements of the molecules of the rope are across that direction. So this is called a transverse um, where wa waves. So today we will talk about transverse waves. That's the waves when the carrier is moving uh, perpendicularly to direction of the waves. Okay, now, um, the usual introduction um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented at unisor.com. I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website. Uh, so you go to unisor.com, there is a menu, you choose Physics for Teens, that's the course. And within um, that course there is a rather large chapter, Waves, and you click the Waves, and then you will get again the next menu, where you will find uh, transdense waves, and this is the first lecture um, in in that uh, particular chapter. There is also a prerequisite course called Mass for Teens on the same website, which I suggest you to be familiar with because physics without mass, basically, it's not really the real physics. Um, now the the website is completely free. There are no advertisements, there are no strings attached, you don't have to pay anything, it's, uh, you don't even have to sign on if you don't want to. Uh, for self-study without any kind of supervision, etc., you don't really have to sign in. Uh, there are exams uh, on the site which you can just test yourself or your supervisors can test you. Okay, back to business. So, again, we know about longitudinal waves um, and again the, the, the best example is sound waves in the air when the molecules are oscillating along the direction where the propagation of the waves is and now we will talk about a typical example is a rope so let's just consider what happens if you have a rope and then somebody takes this particular end of the rope and start moving it up and down. Well, again, we know from experience that the rope will take something like this shape and the waves will go that way. This will be the direction of the propagation of waves. Um, but my purpose in this lecture is to explain why it happens. It's not easy. I mean, I was myself actually struggling with understanding why the waves are actually propagating. Um, and uh, today we will talk about a qualitative picture, so to speak. We don't really go too much into any kind of a formulas. We will try to explain how the propagation of waves actually is happening. Um, based on certain model. So, the first thing which we need, we have to model this rope in such a way that we can later on apply certain mathematical 
uh, foundation to this. So, what comes to mind? Well, we know that rope contains like little pieces. Uh, little pieces contain even little, littler pieces, smaller pieces, um, down to molecule level. So, something probably is related to molecules and relationship between molecules, etc. So, I'm suggesting as a, a model, actually, to consider the rope as consisting of small objects. Maybe it's molecules, maybe it's just small segments of the rope connected with certain rods. So every piece has certain mass. There is certain distance, let's call it R. This is also M, this is also M. So this is like a necklace, basically. Necklace of beads, which are connected with, let's consider weightless, but rigid rods. Diamond necklace. So these are diamonds, and they have certain weight. And these are connection between these diamonds, which we consider to be weightless. But they are rigid, so they can actually go um, up and down independently from each other, but they are at fixed lengths from each other, always. So, how can we analyze analytically this particular necklace? Well, it's not easy. Let's simplify it even more. Here is the simplification which I suggest. That's it. Just two beads of certain mass connected with a rigid rod, but they can actually change the direction uh, relative to each other. Okay, now, the bit on the left would be the beginning of my uh, rope. That's where I'm actually moving, forcing this particular left bit to move up and down. Now, what I would like to see is how my bit on the right, how my bit on the right would actually move in this particular case. And again, this is not easy. Okay, now, before going into these analytics, um, I would like to, like, finish something which is really like a formal part, which everybody, all, all the textbooks and uh, all the teachers are basically explaining as the most important part of this transverse waves, which I don't consider to be the most important. It's basically a terminology. So this is called a crest of the wave, and this is a crest, and this is a crest. This is the part where the wave goes to the uh, uppermost level. This is a trough. This is a trough. Now, this is distance from this to this its amplitude. I will use letter A for amplitude. The distance between one crest and another is wavelengths. Usually Greek letter lambda. Well, the whole thing resembles a sinusoid, right? Well, it's not really a sinusoid, but very close to it. It's obviously periodic, and it's kind of moving up and down, so it really looks like a sinusoid, but that's all right. Now, um, if you measure the time between one particular piece of the rope, this one, moves let's say from the top position down to the bottom position and then to the top, that is called 
period. It's a time period. Time between the same particle or, or the same little piece of the rope makes the full cycle from top to top or from bottom to bottom or from middle point to middle point, whatever you want to do. It. So this is the um, it's called the period. Well, basically, that's it about terminology. So we finished this, and uh, this is as much as you know. Everybody knows about the waves. Whatever I'm talking about right now is much more involved, and um, in my particular viewpoint, it's more important because I would like to analyze the forces which are acting in this kind of a movement. So, let me get rid of this. So we finished this formal part of this lecture. Now it's more involved, I would say. So, uh, we are talking about um, a movement of two particles, one and two. This is my vertical direction. And this is the rod between them. Let's call this alpha and this is beta. Both have mass, m and m, and there is a fixed distance between them, r. We are forcing moving alpha up and down. From minus a to plus a. This is amplitude, right? Remember this amplitude. Now, initially, let me put this a little higher. Okay, initially, let's consider we start from this position. And um, this would be alpha, and this would be beta. So they're lying down. What kind of forces are basically acting. Well, let's just think about the movement. As I'm moving alpha from position minus a to plus a through the zero, what actually happens with alpha? Well, if I'm doing movements like that, that means that I'm speeding up first and then slowing down to speed zero, right? And then go back again speeding up and slowing down that's basically my movement otherwise I will not be able to stop here and here so I begin my movement and I end my movement which means I have to speed up and then slow down as alpha is moving this way how is beta moving well let's just think about it. as I'm moving from this position to this position this is my rod I'm moving only this part. What happens with beta? Well, if I'm moving to this position, let's say, well, beta is supposed to move this direction because, because this is supposed to be the same length as this one. Not exactly. Something like this. So this length is supposed to be equal to this length. This is the distance r between these two particles, these two objects. And this moves up, and this is still here, which means this is kind of delaying movement. And that's why it will not move vertically up, because we don't have any force which moves up. We, we have the force only here, which means we're basically stretching the rod. The rod becomes tense. And it's a tension force, which in the beginning, it always acting along the road, because we are basically pulling by this road. So the tension begins here, but as this thing is going up, the tension becomes uh, 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 the tension is at angle, and there is a vertical and horizontal component. Vertical is very small in the beginning, mostly it's horizontal, so that's why it's moving this way. But movement again, as, as I'm moving upwards, my position 
is something like this. So my um, my beta object, this is beta, is moving closer and closer to the vertical along which alpha is moving. And it also goes upwards following the alpha because alpha is basically hooked to it by the fixed rod. So as alpha moves this way, beta moves this way. So this is just, you know, qualitative picture. Now I would like to analyze all the forces which are um, acting in this particular case. So, again, back to our picture on a bigger level, bigger scale. So this is alpha, this is beta. So what kind of forces? Well, obviously there is a fixed force which is not very interesting. That's the weight. Since we have a mass, we have P alpha equals to mg. We are assuming that masses are the same, right? So this is the rod between them. Now, the only force, well, besides the weight, which acts on the beta object is whenever we are pulling up. We are talking about the movements up the first quarter, let's say, from the bottom minus A level to zero when we are speeding up. So we are speeding up the alpha and it goes to zero. This is zero level and this is minus alpha level. So from here we are moving to this. We are speeding up alpha. There is an acceleration, which means there is a force, obviously. So there is something which drives alpha upwards. Now, the force, the only force which acts on beta is tension of the rod. And it pulls beta basically along the direction. So the force of tension always um, directed along the rod itself. So the, f the tension should be here. This is function. Tension, beta of time. Oh, it depends on time, obviously. Well, first of all, direction depends, because in the beginning, these two were in, in, in this position, horizontal position, so the tension force was horizontal. Then, as alpha moves up, beta is supposed to follow it, so the tension force changes direction, and most likely changes the uh, value uh, as well. Now, the same tension force acts on alpha, but in a different direction. So, the force of the tension which moves, which acts on alpha should be directed opposite. So, if alpha pulls beta, the way how tension force pulls beta up, it pulls alpha along the same direction, but in, uh, along the same road, but in the opposite direction. And they are actually equal to each other in absolute value. At any given moment of time. So this is how rod pulls beta up and kind of holds down alpha um, and that's basically the function of the road to keep the distance the same. Now, we are moving alpha straight up. Now, if we are moving alpha straight up, we have to have some kind of a force and there is an acceleration. I mean, we can always just think about movement of alpha as being uh, like sinusoidal, up and down. So the y coordinate of alpha, it can be something like um, minus a cosine omega t. 
y I put minus a, so at t is equal to 0, this would be 1 and would be coordinate minus a. So at time a, uh, at time t is equal to 0, my uh, y coordinate would be at minus a. Then at certain moment of time, t which is equal to t over 4, my coordinate would be 0. Then at time t is equal to t uh, by 2, my coordinate would be a. It goes to the top level, a, this is 0. So from, uh, from 0 to t4, to t over 4, I'm going from minus a to 0. Then from t4 to t2, to t over 2, I will go to plus a. Then uh, from t over 2 to 3 quarters of a t, I go back to 0. And uh, at moment t is equal to, to t, OK, 3 quarters of a t, my coordinate would be, again, 0. And the t is equal to t, my coordinate would be, as before, minus a. That's what we started. It would be minus a if t is equal to 0, right? So this is what this formula gives me. So I know the movement of alpha. I would like to know what would be the movement of beta. And again, right now we're talking about only from here to here. So from t is equal to 0 to t is equal to uh, t over 4, where my coordinate would be 0. This is acceleration. Then would be deceleration. OK, so acceleration. What must be my force acting on alpha to give the straight up acceleration? Well, I cannot really put this force straight up. Why? Well, because this is uh, at angle, right? Which means there is a um, horizontal, horizontal and vertical composition of this, right? This is vertical, which actually pulls down, and this is horizontal, which moves to the right. Which means my force should neutralize this horizontal component and this vertical component and add something more to, in, to, 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 to accelerate the movement up. So the force should be something like this. Now, when we are moving a rope up and down, well, we do not think about this. We think about we are moving only vertically. But, but we are not thinking that we actually have to have some kind of angle because we are pulling um, the rope, well, the next bead, let's put it this way, we are pulling the next bead up and it moves towards the vertical um, uh, direction. It's a minor movement, don't take me wrong. Mo most important movement, major movement is obviously up and down. But there must be some, because if this is the distance between two molecules, obviously it's a small distance, but it's supposed to be from this to this, which means we are moving to the left. And that's what actually uh, makes the force, uh, if we are moving uh, strictly vertical, the alpha, uh, the alpha bead, then the force must have certain angle. Now, what we can do actually, we can put some kind of a railing here. We will move it up and down, but we have to really think about that there is always the reaction of the railing, which doesn't let the uh, alpha to move left or right. So we will move it up and down, but there is also some kind of a reaction of the um, railing which keeps it on this vertical direction. So the resulting force in this particular quarter of a period, the resulting force will be at slight angle. That's very important, actually. It's not very important to uh, really like shape the rope, but it's very important to understand all the forces which are acting 
in this particular case. It's an extremely complex movement, by the way. We just think about this, okay? Why, uh, we are b making waves in the rope and really simple. It's not simple. So, and don't forget that all these forces are changing with time. Primarily, the direction is changing. The road used to be this way, and at the end of this, it will be almost vertical, right? So it changes. Okay, now, will beta ever reach the same vertical where alpha is moving? No. It will move closer. But as soon as um, alpha reaches the level zero, which means that's the maximum speed, of alpha, then it will start decelerate. Alpha will start decelerate. Now beta is moving in both directions, vertical and horizontal. Vertical here and horizontal here as a result of this tension force. And uh, though it will not move in a vertical direction with the same speed as alpha, but it will follow, so it will also increase its vertical component. Um, let's not talk about how fast it will go towards the left, towards this vertical. It will go with certain speed. But since most important direction of the alpha is vertical, the beta will also increase its speed vertically to a certain degree. Okay, so that's what happens during the first quarter of a period. I would say that the direction, the trajectory, let's put this, the trajectory from this level would be something like this. It would be closer to, if I will continue with movement of alpha indefinitely up, uh, with a constant speed or accelerating doesn't really matter. What's important is we do not decelerate if I'm just moving up all the time. The beta would move closer and closer to the vertical, so that would be some kind of asymptotic movement of beta. As alpha moves up, beta would move closer and closer and follow alpha. Eventually, it will be very, very close, and vertical component of beta will be almost the same as, uh, as, compo as, as vertical component of alpha. Uh, but also, it will have always horizontal, weaker and weaker, so it's slower and slower moving towards vertical. It's faster, the, the horizontal movement would be faster here, and much slower here, and again, it's uh, asymptotic movement. Um, there is a um, a curve called tractrix, which actually resembles this. That's when you are just pulling with a constant speed. You are pulling on a cord, some kind of an object. You are, you are going this way, and object is going this way. So this is called tractrix. So it resembles it, but not exactly. And in our case, our movement is much more complex. We are not moving up with a constant speed. We are accelerating and then we're decelerating. And now we are approaching the second quarter of the movement from zero to up, to, 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 uh, to the top amplitude, to the A. Okay, what happens there? Okay, let's draw another picture. Again, I'm talking today only about um, pictures of how basically the whole thing might move without, almost without any quantitative characteristics. Well, except I just had a formula for movement of the alpha. I assume this is the formula, but again, it's just a model. Okay, now we are talking about from zero, somewhere here is minus A, but this is plus A. 
Now, in the beginning of this second quarter, my, um, by the way, in this particular case, t period is equal to 2 pi over omega. Omega is angular speed or angular frequency. So, um, now we are talking about the second quarter from uh, t over 4 to t, to t over 2. Now, at this moment, since we are accelerating all the time, my beta object is moving up and closer, so probably it's somewhere here, approximately. And this is my alpha. And again, let's talk about forces which are acting on these. Alpha stopped accelerating, it starts decelerating. So, alpha is decelerating. Now, beta, what kind of forces are acting right now? Well, beta continues moving with the speed alpha has reached at this particular moment, up and horizontally. Now, it will probably be faster now than alpha. So alpha is breaking down the speed, but beta is still um, moving with the same speed alpha was uh, at, at, point, uh, at point zero. So what does it mean? It means that the tension would be different. Instead of rod pulling beta up, now beta would push the rod up. So the tension would be directed this way. So this object would push the rod. Instead of rod pulling the object, object will push the rod. So that would be my t beta of t of time. Well, obviously there is a weight. So these are basically interesting forces. Now, onto beta would, would only, uh, its weight would, would actually uh, do. And then the beta would actually push the road, the rod, and, and, the, and this pressure would be applied to, um, to alpha. Now, alpha is still supposed to move on this particular um, uh, distance. So, what actually would be um, forces which are uh, acting in this particular case, in this object? Well, my force obviously should be independent of this, but let's talk about what kind of force I should really. Since our force should actually break down the whole system, it should resist, so the alpha would push the road in the opposite direction. Because the road is supposed to be rigid, right? Now, obviously, there is a weight. And then, what does it mean that what, what kind of a force should, should be actually acting on alpha? Well, we have to break it down, so the force should be down. But again, not exactly vertically down since this force will have horizontal and vertical composition, now we should really somehow neutralize. So the force would be at this particular angle, not exactly vertical. So what's interesting is that, again, the force which we are um, applying onto the object, whenever we are pulling it, we are thinking we are pulling it up and down. The real force would be, again, at slight angle from the vertical. On the way up, it was angled towards this direction. On the way, on, 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 the, on the acceleration, on the deceleration, the force should really um, uh, be directed against the, the movement, right, to decelerate. So whenever we are moving up, we are accelerating and then decelerating. 
So decelerating means we are applying the force which actually going back uh, uh, in an opposite direction to a, to, a, uh, to a movement, which means down. But again, at slight angle, because we really have to apply some kind of a pressure onto the road. Now, what happens in this particular case? Well, if I am applying this pressure towards the road, this pressure also has certain uh, force applied against this these beta, because the length is supposed to be the same. And what does it mean? What happens with beta when alpha is decelerating? Beta is trying to move as it was because of inertia, but the rod, the fixed length of the rod prevents it. If this goes down, 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 this is also supposed to decelerate somehow. But since the rod is the same, it will start moving this direction, slightly outside. So the angle, this angle, would be smaller, I mean bigger, sorry, bigger here, and then bigger again here. Because the beta would go with the same um, the beta will have certain inertia. We are breaking down only alpha movement, but the beta will continue moving with the same um, inertia as before, but its direction is um, restricted because we have this, the fixed length. If all of a sudden I just momentarily stop alpha, what would be with the beta? Well, since it was moving up, in this direction, now we are stopping alpha. It would continue, upwards movement will give you, basically it will go on a circle. But it doesn't go in a circle because alpha is not stopping, alpha is just slowing down, which means the beta will, will start also moving uh, slower, but again it will be on a further and further distance. So if before <coughs> my movement was like this, now my movement would be like this, and eventually almost horizontal. Now um, I'm kind of extrapolating these thoughts. So as alpha is moving vertically up and down, beta is supposed to move on some kind of a curve. It would be further um, in the beginning and uh, at the very end of this half a period and closer uh, somewhere in the middle. Now what happens somewhere here? Well, it depends. For instance, if the speed is not very high at this middle point, which means it will reach certain position like this one and then we are decelerating. Well, what happened, it might actually go this way and then go this way along the same trajectory. Or it might actually make some kind of a um, little loop. What if the speed is so significant, for whatever reason, that, um, that it will, after this position, it will go even more around. This will stop and this will go even by inertia a little bit more. Then goes down and that was supposed to follow, so maybe it would be something like this direction. I'm not sure myself, it depends actually on many different things. The length of the road, the masses of these, and on the amplitude. So these, uh, and the speed of movement up and down, or if you wish, the angular speed of this movement. These are all analytical things which we will explain in some details, not in all details, because it's a very complicated movement actually. Um, but my purpose was to basically talk about forces which are acting and the direction, the trajectory of the second bead, second bead on, on this necklace, uh, if the first bead is going vertically up and down. So this direction would be, again, kind of a very 
complicated curve. And then uh, add to this the third bid, for instance. The third bid would follow the, f the second one, right? Also in the same length. And it would be even more complicated curve. Well, again, the most important is obviously direction up and down. The direction left and right would not be as visible as in this particular case. But you should understand that this is complicated and this kind of a movement would be definitely um, not exactly straightforward. And just imagine it's uh, quite simple if you have a rope of certain lengths and then you convert it into this type of things. This is a curve which is more, which is lengthier. So it cannot really be that every particle would move only vertically up and down. The, the, the length of the row is, is fixed, it's this one, horizontally. So it should really compress a little bit. So the true picture would be the same row. If this is the original length, then the length when it's actually moving up and down would end somewhere before that because the length of this should be equal to this which means that every particle of this rope actually moves left whenever we are moving uh, making this type of things and that's what this particular curve represents it's it's squeezing basically uh, but and it's squeezing because this length is uh, is the same as this length so the movement from here to here is not vertical it's at the angle and then again it goes here not along the straight line it will go along this curve so this is all the complications which are related to transverse movement which means that transverse movement is not really up and down for every particular particle as usually simplified in most of the textbooks it's much more complicated and whenever you're talking about for instance um, a, a, a string instrument like a violin that's a perfect example of, uh, uh, of, of the waves which are usually qualified as transverse but if you think about it if this is your string and then you're stretching the string. Now, what happens actually? Well, you're stretching, which means you're stretching every rod which connects two molecules, right? Every little rod is become. So the story is, is even more complicated because in this case, I was considering that the, the rod is actually of a fixed length. In this case, to enable the vertical movement of each component of a string we have to have these rods stretchable so it's like a spring now so every rod is a spring and this gives me a new mo model of our um, transverse um, uh, oscillations the, uh, the model when, when this rod is not of a fixed length which gives this type of a wave but the rod is stretchable, like a spring. So every rod between two molecules, every connection is a little spring. And another example, you have waves on the surface of the water. It's the same thing. It's much more complicated. It's not up and down, obviously. Um, these are more like this one. So every molecule of the water goes along some kind of an ellipsoidal wave and then transfers to a se different one. And what's most important is the, the, the purpose I wanted actually to, to, to explain all this is for you to understand that why we have the propagation of waves. Very simply, because the maximum um, of the alpha point in this particular case is prior to the maximum of this one because when alpha has already stopped this one the, the beta is still continue to move up and only at the very 
end when it's all when it's already started moving down only then the beta will finish this cycle and then it continue to follow so alpha is always ahead of beta and if it's always ahead of beta it means that there is a time difference between alpha reaching its crest at the top position and beta reaching its top because whenever alpha is here beta is still here and then it goes uh, around some circle or whatever it is a curve basically which resembles a circle and only then when alpha starts moving down only then beta reaches the top and then goes around the top and follows alpha that's the delay between these two molecules alpha and beta and since there is a delay that's basically what makes waves propagating the alpha is reaching certain maximum a little bit later beta is reaching the same let's say maximum and then the next object connected to beta let's call it gamma then gamma so there is always a time delay which depends on many different factors uh, as I was saying it depends on the um, uh, angular speed of the uh, alpha oscillation its amplitude the weight and all other um, the length of the rod and other uh, physical quantities but there is always a delay and since the, there is there is a delay we have this difference in time between alpha reaching the maximum then a little bit later beta reaching the maximum then gamma reaching the maximum and that's what makes the propagation of the wave after reaching the maximum they obviously follow the same direction so again it goes down and this goes down but later on because it's on certain fixed lengths and then it only follows well I think that's all I wanted to talk about today no calculations no big formulas etc it's a qualitative explanation of what kind of forces are acting um, uh, on different beads if you fa if you wish uh, to use this model beads of uh, necklace uh, or every molecule of a, of a rope whenever the rope actually making these oscillations and uh, I was trying to explain that because of the time delay between alpha reaching the crest and beta reaching the crest that's what actually makes the wave propagation so that was the purpose of today's lecture okay so and I also hope that um, you understand how complex these things are so whenever we are talking about certain uh, relatively simple calculations which uh, usually are presented in the textbook it's a simplification reality is much more complex and obviously we are we are researching our nature using the model so, so we are simplifying the model we are having a simplified view which is not exactly what's going on but to a certain degree it explains certain things and during the next lecture too I will probably try to do the same I will simplify as much as I can just to reach certain relatively simple formulas which assume assumingly um, represent the the reality to a certain degree okay um, I suggest you to read the explanation which I have um, on the website the every lecture has a uh, notes and uh, the notes are basically the same thing as I'm saying plus a little bit better pictures maybe um, so I do suggest you to go to uh, unisor.com choose the physics for teens waves um, partition wa waves part of this uh, course and uh, transverse waves as the topic we are talking about okay that's it thank you very much and good luck